This evening and for the next uh, several weeks, uh, for the benefit of those who will be watching these classes on uh, the, the video series, the people who have been attending these classes were uh, in the past week on the Feast of the Theophany of the Lord uh, received into the communion of the church by baptism and chrismation. And now uh, we are going to continue to speak of what is at the heart of the life of the church, and that is the sacrament of the Eucharist, the sacrament of sacraments, that, that mystery that is at the heart of the church's life. I uh, will begin this, uh, this talk tonight with some words from uh, Father Alexander Schmemann from the book For the Life of the World. From its very beginning, Christianity has been the proclamation of joy, of the only possible joy on earth. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, said the angel to the shepherds. And Father Alexander adds, We have no other means of entering into that joy, no other way of understanding it, except through the one action which from the beginning has been for the church both the source and the fulfillment of joy, the very sacrament of joy, the Eucharist. In the Gospel of St. Luke, when the two disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus on the first Pascha, and Jesus appears to them, and they are unable to recognize him. The Gospel account says their eyes were held so that they did not know him. And he interpreted the scriptures to them, saying that everything written about him in the Old Testament, in the, in the books of Moses, in the prophets and the Psalms, had to be fulfilled, that the Messiah had to suffer and enter into his glory. And then they, were, they got to the village of Emmaus, where they were going, and he uh, pretended that he was going further, and they asked him to stay. And he went in with them, and... He took the bread and broke it, and St. Luke tells us that at that point, their eyes were opened and they knew him, they recognized him. And at that point, he vanished from their sight, and they ran back immediately to uh, tell the apostles who were in hiding in Jerusalem that the Lord is risen. And they also said, did not our hearts burn within us? And, and they told the apostles how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So I always like, even before to referring to the many other uh, passages in the scripture, both in the Gospels, the accounts of the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, or when St. Paul speaks of it in the first epistle to the Corinthians, I always like to begin there because that passage, more than any other, has expressed the church's experience in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is not so much a subject of analysis for, for the Orthodox Christian. Rather, it is the heart of the church knowing her Lord. The church, the bride of Christ, having communion with the bridegroom. The Eucharist is the marriage between the bridegroom and the bride. The Eucharist is the means given to the church by the Lord so that His promise to his disciples would be fulfilled, that he would be with us until the end of the world. And most intensely, not in isolation from the many other ways that the Lord is present with us, and we're going to see that as we uh, will begin next week, you'll each have a book with the Divine Liturgy in it, and we'll go through the, the Divine Liturgy systematically and, and, and speak of it. And we'll see that the Divine Liturgy celebrates an increasingly intense experience of the presence of Christ. First we celebrate Christ present within the members of the church as the members of the church assemble to be the church. Then we experience the presence of Christ in his word. But ultimately the greatest presence, the presence that makes all other presences real as long as this world exists, as long as time exists, is the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood, 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, St. Paul says, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. So that in the celebration of the Eucharist, everything that the Lord accomplishes for us through his passion, death, and resurrection, through his ascension, through his sitting at the right hand of the Father and interceding for us, as the epistle to the Hebrews tells us, and even the second coming becomes present. We read, we can read many passages in, in the book of Revelation that speak of the heavenly worship of, of the church in the presence of the Lamb falling down in adoration before the Lamb who, though slain, lives. And all of those wonderful descriptions in the book of Revelation uh, are an expression of this Eucharistic experience uh, beginning in the early church and continuing till now. The Eucharist is the very word itself, of course, uh, uh, comes from the Greek Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving. The Eucharist is spoken of in the church as the sacrifice of thanksgiving. That when the church comes together to be the church, as we're going to, sp to say when we speak of even the bread of the Eucharist, there, there is an ancient prayer from that first century document that we've referred to previously, the Didache, that says, as the many grains of wheat from the hillside ca came together to make this one bread, so gather your church, O Lord, from east to west, north and south, to your table in, in your kingdom. So, the Eucharist as the means by which the body of Christ, which is the church, becomes what she is, the body of Christ. For us members to be united with Christ, the head of the body, it must be within the body that that union takes place. That's why that union is called communion, the union between the members of the body with the head. And as always, when we speak of being united with Christ, it is not with, any, with, not with an idea of Christ. It's not with, with thoughts or, or memories about Christ. It's not with, with simply rational knowledge about Christ. All these things may have their place. But always the heart of it is union with Christ himself. Union with the incarnate word. Union with the one who takes our flesh and our blood, the, the eternal Son of God, who unites his divinity to that materiality of our existence, who takes that to himself and in that incarnation makes it possible for our entire existence, our body, our soul, our spirit, to be united to God through his death and resurrection. So it is the encounter of the church, the bride of Christ, with the bridegroom who has made salvation and eternal life possible for the members of his body by his death and resurrection. So that is, that is the great mystery of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is always spoken of as a celebration, a giving of thanks. Giving of thanks to God for his wonderful deeds. That's always been at the heart of the worship of God's chosen people, whether in the Old Covenant or in the New Covenant. We know that Jesus gave us the Eucharist at the feast. Actually, it was before the feast of the Passover. We're going to talk about that a little bit. It was a day before the feast of the Passover because the Gospel of John tells us that the Lord was crucified at the time when the Passover lambs were being sacrificed. So the meal that Jesus has with his apostles that we call the Last Supper on Holy Thursday, at which he gave them the Eucharist, takes place a day before the actual Passover. But the reason why it takes place a day early is Jesus knows all things. 
the Gospel of John tells us, uh, that the Lord, knowing that his hour had come, having loved his own in, in this world, he loved them until the end. Knowing that on the eve of the Passover, when, when the Passover meal would be eaten by, by all the, the people of Israel, knowing that he would be dead on the cross on that day, he a day earlier takes the opportunity to give to his disciples the new Passover, the Passover that fulfills the old Passover. We heard in the Gospel that we read for the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, how at the very beginning of his public ministry, John points out Jesus by calling him the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb in the imagery of the Old Covenant is the means by which God saved the people of Israel from, from bondage in Egypt. Uh, you, know, you know the account. You're familiar with that, I think. That, that God told Moses to tell the people that, that they had to take a male lamb without blemish uh, and they had to slaughter it at evening and they had to take the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the house. And then they were to roast the lamb and eat the lamb. Uh, they were to eat the whole thing. None of it could remain. They were to eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. That the angel of, of death that was going to strike Egypt... Uh, on, the, on that night would see the blood and pass by and God's people would be delivered from death. And as a result of what happened on that night, the people of Israel were set free from Egypt. Now, in the hymns of the Orthodox Church, uh, we sing on Easter morning uh, uh, a hymn that, that speaks of how everything that went on before has been, in the Old Testament, has been fulfilled in the New. We sing, this is the day of resurrection, let us be radiant, O people, it is the Passover, the Lord's Passover. For from death to life and from earth to heaven, Christ our God has led us, as we sing the song of victory. So in the New Covenant, the Release is not simply from slavery in Egypt, but from slavery uh, to death and sin. Slavery, uh, the slavery of Israel in Egypt was an image uh, of the slavery of, of every member of the human race to death and sin. So what takes place uh, in an incomplete manner, because the Passover of the Old Testament uh, involves only what's going on in this world, even though it is, it is uh, a revelation, a manifestation of, of the saving mighty power of God who delivers his people. Yet nevertheless, they are delivered from slavery in one place and they are brought miraculously out of Egypt through the Red Sea to enter into the Promised Land, another geographical place in this world. But the new Passover is, is immeasurably more than that because we are delivered from slavery, but it is slavery to the emptiness and death and cursedness and sin of this life, uh, of this world, which, which cannot of itself ever become the kingdom of God. And we are led by Christ through the waters of the sea. Uh, you, you heard on the evening that, that you were baptized and chrismated, that all of us have passed through the cloud and the sea. Uh, and we have eaten of, of the spiritual food and drunk of the spiritual drink that comes from the rock that is Christ. It's Christ who has led us through, through the sea. And the sea here is the sea of death. Uh, the waters of baptism, you know, are the image of death. And he has led us through that sea by entering into the depths of death himself. He has raised us with himself. And he has led us into the promised land of his eternal kingdom where we partake of the food of immortality the banquet of immortality. Jesus said to his apostles at the Last Supper, you shall eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And, and that didn't mean that, that, that the end of the world had to come before that would happen. Rather, it was fulfilled right there uh, at the Last Supper. So, Israel kept the Passover. It was at the heart of, of their experience as, as the chosen people. And... So it was two things, that Passover meal that was kept in the, in the uh, Old Covenant. First of all, it was uh, a giving of thanks, a sacrifice of thanksgiving for God delivering his people. But it is also, and this is very important, because it, uh, unless we understand this very clearly, uh, we, we'll never 
it won't be possible for us to, to understand what the church experiences in the Eucharist. The Passover of the Old Testament and the Passover of the New Testament, both of these, are memorials. Jesus says, after he gives uh, the, the Eucharist to his apostles at the Last Supper, do this in memory of me, or actually a more precise way to translate his words would be, do this as my memorial. And what the Lord is saying there is that as the Passover was celebrated up until him as the, as the memorial of the Exodus, so also now he gives his body and blood as the new memorial. What is a memorial? A, mor a memorial is not a simple remembrance of something in the past that is over with. Even in the Old Testament, the rabbis would teach the people that when they celebrated the Passover, even though the actual exodus may have taken place centuries ago, that when they celebrated that Passover meal, they also, like their forefathers, passed out of Egypt. And I like to use uh, a word that comes from my teacher, uh, Father Alexander Schmemann, to speak of what a uh, to describe what a memorial is. A memorial is the actualization of the saving deeds of God that he has done for us. It's not simply a remembrance of them as if they were past historical events that we can't have any contact with anymore. Rather, it's our entering into them. How can we enter into them? Uh, we, if, we, if we, on the level of this world, celebrate such things as the birthdays of national heroes, we remember them in the past, but we, we do not contact them. But the difference is that when we have the memorial of God, the divine memorial, do this as my memorial, Jesus says, and St. Paul says that when we do it, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What we partake of is something that is not confined by time and space. The saving works of God, all of them, but, but ultimately the core, what is at the heart of, of God's saving works for us, are, are those things that we speak of in the divine liturgy. The cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven, the sitting at the right hand, the second and glorious coming. These things... Although they take place in history, they are far beyond history because they are acts of God. They are not confined in history. They are not, they are not held or limited by those days in, in uh, the year 33 AD when they took place. Rather, they have eternal power, we could say, and eternal presence. God, ha everything that God has accomplished for his people during those days remains accessible to us. That's what the Lord means when he says, do this as my memorial. Now, another thing that I always, uh, I always say when, when beginning to speak of the Holy Eucharist and I may have said this already, uh, even previously in the catechumen class, the inquirer class, rather, uh, is that we must realize uh, something that is often passed over, that when the Lord Jesus, at the Last Supper, takes the bread, takes the cup, and gives it to his disciples, he speaks in the present tense. He says, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Drink all of this, or, or drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. Now, that is a different thing from saying, this is my body, which will be broken for you when I die tomorrow. Uh, or, this is my blood, which will be shed for you when I suffer tomorrow. See, there's no future tense there. It's all in the present. And in that is, in that present, if we understand that, and not only with our minds, but with our heart, we will, we will understand to the, to the extent that it is possible for us what the Lord leaves us, what the Lord gives us in the Eucharist. Because when the Lord speaks of his body and his blood being given to his disciples now, not tomorrow, but now. Everything that will take place 
uh, with Jesus on Good Friday, his sacrifice and death on the cross is already made present. See, and, and so what's being done at the Last Supper is the Lord voluntarily, by that act of declaring his body and blood to be already in the eternal presence of God, broken and shed, what's being said there is, first of all, what's going to happen on the next day happens because he wills it to happen as we've said before. Not because it's some, it's some horrible tragedy that befalls him at the hands of evil people who hate him and want to do away with him, although they are there. But unless he had willed it to be, it would not, it would not have happened. No one takes my life from me, Jesus says. I have power to lay down my life. I have power to take it up again. So that's why at every celebration of the Eucharist in the, in the central prayer of the liturgy that we're going to speak uh, in, more, in more detail in the next couple weeks, uh, we say every time, when he, was, when he was about to go forth to his voluntary, voluntary uh, and life-giving death, on the night in which he was given up, and then we stop and pause and we say, or rather, gave himself up for the life of the world. So it is a voluntary giving of himself up that the Lord gives in the Eucharist so that when his passion and the shedding of his blood and the suffering and death of his body begins on Good Friday, it is already something that he has willed, accepted, and embraced in the heart of his divine being. So when we speak of the Eucharist as in effect what it is, the last will and testament of the Lord. It is what he leaves his church. What he leaves his church is himself. What he leaves his church is the, the love, the divine, the perfect divine human love that makes him freely, voluntarily give himself, who is the author of life, over to death, out of love, for, uh, because not able, as we said in the prayer when we blessed the baptismal water, not able to endure, not able to bear the work of his hands, the human race, lost in the corruption of death and sin. So, our salvation, which comes from, and only from, that voluntary offering of, by Christ of himself in love. That is what is given to us in the Eucharist. And I, I probably mentioned before, because it's something that I never get tired of speaking of, uh, because I think it, it is how uh, Christ shows us who he is and, and how, how indescribably great is his love for us. That's why when the Lord leaves the table of the Last Supper and goes to the Garden of Olives, where he, where he, will, be, where he will be handed over to those who will kill him, the first shedding of his blood comes from him. Uh, the, the gospel tells us that, that, his, that in his agony, his sweat becomes as great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. So before his blood will be shed at, at the hand of those who will torture and kill him, it's already been shed from inside him. See, so th and, that, and that, the saints tell us, is... is uh, there, there could be no deeper way that he would show us that it is himself that, that he gives us. So that greatest treasure of the church, which is the bride of Christ, is the presence of the bridegroom in her midst. And that's why until the end of the world, we always speak in the church of there being one liturgy. There's only one liturgy. We, even though we had what we call a celebration of the liturgy, uh, two of them last week for the Feast of the Theophany, one the day after, one on Sunday, one this morning, how many, how many dozens or, or, or even more, uh, more than a hundred do we have in the course of a year? Yet nevertheless, they are not distinct from each other. They are all entering our actualization given us, made possible to us by Christ, of 
entering inside this mystery of the love of God who gives himself over to death, who is raised from the dead to give us newness of life, and who feeds us with that food which is himself not simply a, a, a memory of himself in the past, but his, his presence among his people now in this world until the end of the world. So that's why uh, the Holy Eucharist is the heartbeat of the church's life. It is, it is the sap that keeps the tree of the church alive. Without the Holy Eucharist, there is no church. So I, I say that by uh, way of introduction. And now what I want to begin to do is I want to go through the liturgy as we celebrate it now. Uh, you know, this, this is not, uh, this is not uh, the right place to have a, a, a complicated class in the history of the development of the liturgy. There's, there are plenty of, of books to read uh, for those who wish, and it's always a good thing to study. Occasionally, I will, um, I will mention things that have happened along, along the way of the development of the Church's liturgy, but I want to speak about the way it is now celebrated in, in the life of the Orthodox Church, uh, going through it systematically and and, and showing uh, how we are to understand it, how we are to experience it. And to do that, uh, we have to begin. Uh, a lot of times, uh, people open their, their service books, and of course, uh, the first exclamation of the priest, and by the way, speaking of, of priests, uh, we... Uh, We'll speak of, of them again when we talk about the sacrament of ordination. But just as we speak of there being only one liturgy, the perfect, the, the perfect sacrifice, voluntary sacrifice by Christ of himself, the, the actualization of his death and resurrection and even his second coming by, by uh, his people. That's why, by the way, uh, when we say we remember, uh, notice that... Uh, in, in every, every time we, we have the prayers of the Divine Liturgy, we say, we remember the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven, the sitting at the right hand, and the second and glorious coming. See, we say we remember that. So we're not talking about the usual historical past way of remembering here. We're talking about a remembering that is far deeper. It's, it's entering into the, the divine present and made possible for us, not, not by any means of our own, but, but by the love of God for us. So, this, just as there is only one liturgy and each celebration of the liturgy in time, uh, that's, why, that's why I've never been, for those of you maybe who have come from, from the background of, of the Reformation, and, and where there were, were great deal of, of battles fought over, over uh, people who, who, uh, who, wouldn't, who rejected a, a notion of the, of the liturgy that they thought was a, a, a repetition. Of, of the sacrifice of Christ. Well, there, we have no, no such theology in, in the Orthodox Church. There is no repetition of the sacrifice of Christ. There is only the sacrifice of Christ present until the end of the world. And we don't, Christ is not, that's why we speak of it over and over again as the sacrifice without the shedding of blood. It is not, it is not on the one hand a historical reenactment of, of the crucifixion and burial and resurrection of Christ. Rather, it is an entrance into the presence of the crucifixion, burial, rising, ascension, and, and even, uh, even return of Christ in glory. And so just as there is only one liturgy, Christ's liturgy, so also there is only one priest, Christ the great high priest. Now, uh, we speak, we use the word priest in, in many senses. Its most basic sense is, uh, is refers to every member of the body of Christ, that we are all members of the Lord's priestly people. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, St. Peter says. So that every member of the church is in that sense, and it is the most basic sense, a priest. Christ makes it so. It is a share in the priesthood of Christ, not by anything that we have of our own. And, and the priest is the one who, who makes possible the reconciliation between God and man. And, and in Christ and through Christ in us, God and man are reconciled. So we become, we become the priests of, of the new creation. In fact, even, it's interesting to, uh, 
to look at if you we if you read at how the, uh, read how the priests of the Old Testament Israel were ordained. Uh, they were first uh, washed, then they were clothed, then they were anointed with oil, and then they offered the sacrifice. Now, in the new covenant, uh, when when a man or a woman enters into the communion of the body of Christ in the church. What happens to them? They are washed, they are clothed, they are, anointed, they are anointed with oil, they offer and partake of the sacrifice, you see. So the priest of the Old Testament, uh, that, that, is, that is fulfilled and every member of the church shares in that priesthood, in the new covenant. However, there is another sense in which the, the word priest is used and that is that as long as the church exists in time, or another way of saying it is until the, until the end of the world comes, the Lord uses human instruments, flesh and blood instruments, to be the means through which the sacraments are made present in the church. The sacraments exist as long as this world exists, as long as time exists. In heaven... When, when the Lord returns in glory and time comes to an end, there's not going to be any more celebrations of the divine liturgy. There's not, God will be all in all. There's, there's not going to be any, any church buildings. That's why St. John says in the Revelation, I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty is the temple. But as long as time exists and the church exists in this world and the Lord uses the means of the sacraments to, to make himself present with his people, there are those who are taken from the midst of the Lord's priestly people and are set aside by ordination to be the means through which Christ as head and bridegroom becomes present among his people. Now, we speak of the body of Christ as consisting of the head and the members. To have a, have a complete body, you have to have both the head and the rest of the body. You can't have a headless body or, or uh, uh, otherwise not complete. So, for the church to be complete, Christ must be present both as head and as members. And both the presence of the head and the members manifest that, that Christ is present with his people. So that the purpose of the ordained priest, wh whom we call now, sometimes the expression is used, the celebrant of the liturgy, though, though again, in the most basic sense, all the members of the church are celebrants of the liturgy. We, and we always speak of the liturgy as a celebration, always as a celebration, the sacrifice of joy and thanksgiving. That's why I read those words of Father Alexander, the Eucharist is the very sacrament of joy, the source and the fulfillment of joy. Why joy? Because joy is the presence of the Lord with his people. Now, the purpose then of the ordained priest is that for the church to be complete, Christ must be present as head and as bridegroom. And he chooses to manifest that presence, as he always does, through, through human means. And the human means that, that is used by him to make himself present as head and bridegroom of the body is through the ordained priest. Now, I say that by means of introduction because long before the first words of the liturgy that people think of the liturgy as, as beginning with the words blessed is the kingdom of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now and ever and unto ages of ages. But before that can happen, a lot of other things have to happen first. And that's what I want to speak of this evening. I want to speak of the things that happen before the church has actually is actually ready to say those words blessed is the kingdom and that that exclamation at the beginning of the divine liturgy uh, is so central to how we are to understand it to bless something to bless God and his kingdom is to declare him to be the source of our desire it also is to declare him to be where we are going the liturgy is always best understood as a journey 
and we're going to talk about it, it a, a great deal in, in, that, in that context. It's not a journey that takes place uh, geographically. It takes place in much deeper sense. But it is a journey of the church from this world to the kingdom of God. It is the journey of the church being herself. The church, remember we said, ecclesia in, in Greek, the people who are called out called out from this world to be with the Lord at his table in his kingdom. And the liturgy is the experience by the church of, of that passing from this world to the kingdom of God. And once the church has come together and all the preparations are made, then we can declare the kingdom of God to be the place that we are going or as sometimes priests say uh, when they are exhorting the people not to be late for the liturgy, they say, if, you have not, if you're not there by blessed is the kingdom, the bus has left without you. But, uh, <laughs> but before the bus can leave, there must be many, many preparations. The preparation of the members of the body, as well as the preparation of those who serve as the human means through which Christ as head and bridegroom of the body. They both must be prepared. And so that's why uh, Father Alexander used to teach that to the question, when does the liturgy begin, that is begin in time, he would say, the liturgy can be said to begin in time when the people's alarm clocks go off on Sunday morning and they get out of bed with the, in, with the intention and purpose of assembling as the church. Because what they are going to do when they do that is to become what they cannot be, as I, I quoted that prayer from the Didache, as separate grains of wheat. They're coming together to, for, so that the whole can be more than the sum of its parts. see. He would also use the illustration of the making of the Eucharistic bread, which I'm going to uh, speak of a little bit just in, in a while. That the liturgy, the celebration of the liturgy in time can be said to begin when whoever is responsible for making the Eucharistic bread measures out the flour and puts in the yeast and the separate grains of wheat begin their journey to be, first of all, not only something that they would never be naturally by themselves, because, and, and here I'm jumping ahead because I'll, I'll speak of this later, uh, it's very significant that we do not offer wheat and grapes. We offer bread and wine. Bread and wine are what human beings and human beings only, because they are created in the image and likeness of God, can make of wheat and grapes. So, a long journey is going on here that, that begins with measuring out this flower to make, so you have, you, you can see how these things, how these two things, the, the members of the body getting out of their beds to go to the church to become the body of Christ, the measuring out of the flower to come together to be that which it cannot be by itself. They are going to reach the climax of that journey in the central prayer of the liturgy, uh, when, when the Holy Spirit is called down, and, and you're familiar with the words now, again we offer to you this spiritual worship without the shedding of blood. We ask and pray and supplicate you to send down your Holy Spirit upon what? Upon us and upon the gifts the bread and wine now offered. So it's always, they're always parallel. Always the people who are members of the body and the bread and wine that are the product of their hands that are offered to God to become the food that will be the pledge of their resurrection and their partaking of the kingdom while still in this world. So, the question is sometimes when the, when the liturgy is dealt with analytically in, in theological books, you know, what do you need to have to have the celebration of the liturgy? Well, three things are usually spoken of. Uh, you, need, uh, you need the bread and wine. You need uh, the, the ordained priest 
who is who is the human means through which the bread and wine will be offered as the one sacrifice of Christ. And you also need the people who are the members of the body. None of these things exist in isolation from each other. So when those three uh, those three factors, for lack of a better word, begin to be prepared for for this journey. Then the then the the trip to the kingdom of God begins. Now, before uh, the priest comes to the middle of the church, and we say, "Blessed is the kingdom." Uh, a great deal has gone on, and I want to speak of that this morning. This this personal preparation of the ordained priest, who is not uh, he is not there to represent Christ. The priest is not a representative of Christ. He is not there to be a kind of image of Christ. We have an image of Christ in the icon. That's not what the priest is 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 there to be. The priest is the human means through which, just as the bread and wine are the material means through which Christ himself becomes present as as bridegroom and head of the body. So, if one looks now, most of the most of the people's liturgy books they they begin right uh, right with this blessing, blessed is the kingdom, and they don't include what has gone before, but I, I, want, to, I want to go, go through that, uh, at, at least briefly, because it's important that you all know what has gone on in the church uh, regarding the preparation of, of the ordained priest uh, before he can begin, because it's not just for him, it's for the whole church, and it says something very important. First of all, when... Uh, the priest. I, here I'm speaking in the singular, even though uh, in, in in large churches such as ours, such as ours with several clergy, there are there are uh, several priests and deacons who who the, the term is used con celebrate together at each at each celebration of the Eucharist. Yet I'll speak in the singular because, as you know from your experience of, of, of the liturgical services, even though there may be many clergy, still it is the one who is the principal, principal celebrant of the liturgy, the, the term that's used in Greek, the one who stands in the first place, uh, who, is, who is most directly this manifestation of, of Christ as head and bridegroom of the body. So the first thing that happens when, when the priest and the other clergy come to the church building is that there is a series of prayers that they say. Some of you who may have gotten here early uh, before the morning service begins, because in our church, uh, virtually, uh, well, every time the, the Eucharist is celebrated in the morning, of course, it's preceded by the morning service, the, the service of morning prayer, matins. So, so much of this preparation has gone on even before that begins. So you have to get here really early if you want to see that. <laughs> but you'll see that, that the clergy enter the church building and they stand here before the holy doors that lead to the altar and they say a series of prayers. They first say those basic prayers that always begin any rule of prayer. They say the Trisagion prayers. Then they venerate the icons of Christ and the Mother of God. And then they, they say a uh, prayer for, for asking for forgiveness of sins, asking though, though they are sinful and unworthy to be, to be counted as worthy by God to, to be the means through which his sacrifice becomes present among his people. And then they, they enter into, uh, into the altar and go to the place, in this case, uh, it's, it's the, uh, maybe not even all of you realize this, that, that behind uh, the wall there, there is another large room back there. And that is the place where uh, where the clergy vest, and I, I want to speak about uh, vestments, and I even have uh, some, some vestments of priest here that, that I'm probably going to do a little show and tell. Uh, because it's, we are now, of course, speaking of, of the interior life of the church, and it is good for every member of the church to have uh, some familiarity and, and, uh, with, with these things and, and uh, why, what they mean what they mean. 
We use vestments in the church for a number of reasons. Sometimes people have the idea that the reason why we have vestments is that there were special vestments that the priests of the old, uh, that used in the temple. In, in, in Jerusalem, in, in the liturgy of the Old Covenant. And this is kind of a continuation of that. But that's not true. Uh, the, the vestments that are used in, uh, among, among the Orthodox Christians don't have any kind of, uh, don't have any kind of connection uh, with, with the vestments that were used by the priests as they offered the bloody sacrifices in the temple. So it's, we have to have another explanation be, uh, be, besides that. Basically, uh, these clothes that are worn are a kind of uh, stylized form of what a uh, male, or what a man, would wear in the fourth century. Now, why do we why do we continue using them? It's not that we want to simply uh, continue duplicating the the clothes of the fourth century. But there's they serve. I would, I, would, I would speak of it in, uh, as three. They serve three functions. First of all, they do provide a, 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 a... They're an expression of historical continuity in the church. That using, using this, this, these, this clothing that has characterized Christian worship for so many centuries is... It may, it helps us experience that we are not just part of, of the here and now in our own time in history. That we are part of what the church has always done, uh, spread, spread through time. So they, are, they, they help us, they're part of creating, uh, creating the atmosphere, the expression can be used, of the church that, that, that transcends time, exists, th exists from, from the time when it began until the end of time. Secondly, the, the vestments have been given through, through years of Christian experience spiritual meanings. That, first of all, they're the means by which the, the priest, the, the ordained priest, the human man, covers up his own individuality, his own merely human personality, with something that stands for Christ. And thirdly, that they and this this might sound this might sound rather rather simple, but I think it's a, I think it's an, an important point. They give the liturgy uh, a sense of beauty. They're part of many things that, that give the liturgy a sense of beauty. You know, we sing uh, we sing in the psalm, the Lord is king, he is robed in majesty. He is robed in beauty. So, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, these are, what, what we have here are uh, vestments that, that all Orthodox priests use when they celebrate the Eucharist. Now, there are, there are uh, other things that are sometimes worn for other services. And it's interesting to note, by the way, just as, just as a matter of information, that uh, these, these black robes, that you see not only priests but deacons or or, uh, or uh, readers in the church, cantors, uh, monks and nuns. Where these are not vestments; these are these are considered to be uh, street clothes for for the clergy, but they have nothing to do with vestments worn for the liturgical services. So, the vestments, the most basic vestment, uh, and I'll give you the the traditional names for them. They have names in both Greek and Latin. It's basically the same thing. Uh, this is called the, in Greek, the stikarion, or the, the Latin word is a is, uh, simple word, alb. And it comes from the word white. It means the word white. It means the white tunic, the white undergarment. Well, what is it? It's exactly the same as what the newly baptized wear. See, it's this basic expression of if anyone is in Christ, he is the new creation. I have sometimes wished, although I don't have any evidence that this was ever done in the, in the life of the church, that uh, every member of the church would wear their baptismal robe to the liturgy all through their life. 
See, I, I, I have this... The here, now, here I'm just talking to you about my imaginations. I have this idea that, that I wish there was not such a gap between what the ordained priest wears and what the rest of the people in the church wear. I think sometimes it would be n nicer to have it resemble. Uh, but I, I don't know if there's any chance of that happening. But anyway, that's, that's how I think. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to put these on as I go along. Um, and, and, in fact, I'm going to show you what the priest does as he puts on the vestments. Because every act has not, a mere, not merely a practical significance, but a spiritual one, too. That's why every vestment always has a cross on it. Before the priest puts it on, he makes the sign of the cross over it, and he kisses it. And he says there are prayers that accompany the vesting. And in the case of the white garment, the white tunic, he says beautiful words from the prophet Isaiah. He says, My soul shall greatly rejoice in the Lord, for he has clothed me with a garment of salvation. With a robe of gladness has he encompassed me as a bridegroom. He has set a crown on me, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, so has he adorned me. So the white garment is, is the sign of the purity of those who have been freed from sin and death and given life in the new creation. The baptismal robe. Then, the next garment that gets put on is something that has its origin in actually has a political origin. This is called, again, it has, uh, has a big uh, fancy Greek, uh, Greek name called the epitrachelion. Uh, that simply means, by the way, around the neck. That's all it means. Yeah, if, if you think sometimes that these Greek words uh, have, have very, very deep and, and kind of hidden meanings, they often mean something very, very plain and simple. And, and the, the word that, that's used in English to describe this vestment is the stole, and, and that, that coming from the stole that was a scarf. And this has its origin in uh, the judge's scarf in the, in the Roman court, and it was a sign of authority. Someone who wore one of these had, had authority, and this is the sign of, of the authority of Christ as head and bridegroom of the body. And, and so when the priest puts this on, he blesses it and says, Blessed is God who pours out his grace upon his priests, as myrrh upon the head that runs down the beard, uh, the beard of Aaron, flowing down upon the collar of his robes. And then we have some things that could be described as accessories that have some uh, practical significance, but nevertheless they have been given a spiritual uh, meaning also. This is, this is a belt, and it, of course its purpose is to hold things in place so they don't flop around. Uh, but, but still, when, when the priest puts it on, he says, Blessed is God, who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless and sets my feet as a deer on the high places. So he puts that on. And then we have uh, another practical thing. There are, uh, sometimes now here, uh, the, the sleeves of this particular one are narrow anyway, but a lot of times uh, to hold the sleeves in place, if they're bigger sleeves, we have these cuffs. And, and, and uh, they have also been used over the centuries as, as also a kind of adornment, decoration. And so the priest puts the one on, the right, on his right hand and he says, Your right hand, O Lord, is glorified in power. Your right hand has shattered the, your enemies. So, you see, we have, uh, everything is always brought into the context of, uh, it, is, it is through the ordained priest that, that Christ as bridegroom and head is revealed. So we have, we have the purity of Christ, the authority of Christ, the strength of Christ. All of these things, uh, and see, the, all these things are also made in the old way. You know, it's never... Uh, sometimes they try to make shortcuts, but these are very traditional. They always with, just have to tie them. And, and Father Alexander used to say that, that it's good to think as you do this, that, you know, that, that just as Christ was bound in obedience to his Father, so uh, when you do this and tie your hands, 
uh, that you should remember that, that you're called, that your hands are not your own, but through your hands uh, Christ is made present. Then he puts the one on his left hand and says, Your hands, Lord, have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. And then the final, the final vestment, the kind of the uh, one that most people notice because it's the biggest and, and it's the one they try to make the most beautiful. Uh, it's called the, the Philonion or, or the Chasuble. Uh, and it, that word just means a little house. It's a big outer cape is what it is. And the, the priest, again... Uh, kisses it and says, Your priests, O Lord, shall clothe themselves with righteousness and your saints shall rejoice with joy. And then, then he puts that on. Now, in the old days, centuries ago, when they made these, they were big circle that, that went all the way down to the floor, all the way around. And that's why they called them Little House because it was just a huge piece of material with a... Uh, a circle in the middle for putting your head in. Then as time went on, they started to cut the front shorter in order to, to have the hands of, of the priest free so there wouldn't be so much danger you know, with all, uh, in, in handling the, the, uh, the holy gifts of, of the liturgy. So that's how they're made now. And, and this is uh, the, the final vestment, is if, if we can speak of the others being signs of the purity and strength and authority of Christ. Uh, perhaps perhaps the, outer, the outer vestment is, should be understood as a sign of the beauty, the beauty of Christ. So the, when, when the priest is, is covered with all these things, what you, one can see when they are understood and used properly that they are a means of, of manifesting to the church that we have not the merely human uh, being being revealed here, but 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 the the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, who who uses His earthen vessels to be the means by which He becomes present in His church. That's what's that's what's showed by by all of this. And I might mention now too that uh, that it's it's the practice of many Orthodox churches to to vary the colors through the year. Different colors stand for different things. Uh, usually, usually at, the, at the greatest feasts, there, uh, we use uh, white vestments at Pascha for the purity of the resurrection and white also at Theophany because it's the time of baptism uh, uh, and, and for the transfiguration because the Lord is shown in the radiance of his divinity. And sometimes the white is with, is with gold or, or, or decorations. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, then there are colors for other seasons of the year too. There is there is red to show a blood for for the sacrifice of the martyrs or the cross, green to show uh, growth and life at Pentecost with the descent of the Holy Spirit, blue the color of the sky for is the color of the Mother of God because because through her the Lord comes down from heaven to earth, uh, a dark color often purple during the seasons of rep season of repentance in Lent. And, and some churches uh, during during the most the most solemn days of the year during Holy Week, uh, as we do here, will even use black black vestments. Uh, so uh, maybe this will be the time to to uh, break the the. So, so the priest having vested and, uh, and, and the people assembling as members of the body, the one, the one remaining thing to do is, is to prepare uh, the bread and wine uh, for the offering. And that's done also at, at, in, in our present uh, way of celebrating the liturgy before it begins. First, first the priest washes his hands. Again, there's, there's a practical need, of course, to be clean. Uh, to, for, for the celebration of, of the Lord's banquet, but, but also uh, this washing of hands is, is also the sign of, of, of the washing of the heart and mind and soul that, this, that needs to be going on constantly for, in, in the spiritual life. And then, and then the clergy go to, uh, maybe, uh, maybe before you leave tonight, you can, you can look from outside the royal doors because maybe you don't all realize that in addition to the altar in the church, there is another table in, in, in the sanctuary of the church on the left side. Uh, it's not, it's not, not usually visible. It's called the table of preparation or the table of oblation. 
It's always found on the left side. In the, in, uh, the ancient churches, it was not only on the left side, it was a whole either separate room or sometimes even a separate little building. And you can still see that if you go visit some of the ancient churches in, in Greece, for example. But most, mostly in, in uh, modern churches, uh, it's not a separate building. Some places do have it as a separate room, but it's more common that it's, that it's a kind of uh, uh, nook on the left side there with, with a table. On that table are kept the uh, vessels that are used for the Holy Eucharist. And the, the bread and wine are brought there. Now, first a word about uh, the Eucharistic bread. You know, the, the Orthodox Church, as the, the Christians have from the beginning, uses ordinary leavened bread for the Holy Eucharist. Uh, in, in the West, beginning in the early Middle Ages, the practice began of, of using unleavened bread. And this, was a, this became actually a great controversy in the Church. Uh, it was not, and, and again, it wasn't so much, we might think, well, what's the big deal about that? But it's, it's what these things stand for that actually was, was the big deal. Uh, the Orthodox objected very strenuously to the use of, of unleavened bread in the Eucharist for a number of reasons. First of all, because it seemed to them that it was an artificial going back to the Old Testament. Uh, secondly, because it had never been done <laughs> before. Uh, even, and here's, and here's what's at the heart of the matter, uh, it, is, it is as far as we can know and uh, as far as the tradition of the church speaks of it, the, the explanation of the fathers of the church and the scriptures themselves, the bread that was used by the Lord at the Last Supper was most likely, this is not a matter of dogma, but it's a, simply a question of most likely, not unleavened bread. Because the Last Supper was a day before the Passover, it was a day early, the unleavened bread was only baked on, on the day of the slaughtering of the Passover lambs and for the seven days following. There are two words in Greek for bread, one for ordinary bread, artos, and one for the unleavened bread, azima. And when the, the, the Gospel speaks of the Lord taking the bread at the supper, it says he took the artos, the ordinary bread. So, Christians, both East and West, uh, for many, many centuries, uh, used ordinary bread, and, and, and there was even a, a spiritual understanding of it, that Christ, is, that Christ is the yeast that leavens the unleavened bread of the Old Covenant and, it's, and, and makes it rise through his resurrection. So, so the Orthodox were not at all happy by this, this innovation. And they, and they had some pretty strong things to say about it, as a matter of fact. Uh, we, would not, we would not go so far as to say that, that the, use of, uh, the use of unleavened bread is, is totally evil or anything like that. But we would say it is contrary to the tradition of the church, something the church never did, and we certainly don't do it. Uh, the bread in, in, uh, that's used for the Orthodox liturgy is baked by the people in the church. There are, there are a number of people in every Orthodox church that bake the bread. In fact, if anybody wants to learn how to do it among you, there are, there are people here who will show you how, and you can, you can have your turn doing it. Uh, generally, they're round loaves. Uh, depending on the size of the church, they can be bigger or, little, or smaller or larger. <laughs> and, or, or sometimes, uh, depending on how many people are expected to be present at the liturgy uh, for Sunday or great feast. Uh, you expect everybody to be there for weekdays less, so the loaf might be smaller. The Christians have used from very early times some of the earliest Christian artifacts, if they can be called that, are, are bread stamps, bread seals. They are these, these carved wooden stamps that they used to stamp the bread with before it was baked, so it had a design in it. And the most common design that, uh, what, another thing I was going to do but couldn't do it because there wasn't any around, I was going to bring a loaf uh, to show you. But the most common design that's stamped on top of the loaf of Eucharistic bread is what you see uh, on, the, on the front of the altar table. The cross with the Greek letters I-C-X-C-N-I-K-A. It's one of the earliest Christian, uh, Christian abbreviations which stands for Jesus Christ the Conqueror. So, the loaves of Eucharistic bread are stamped with that. And so, the priest takes uh, the loaf and cuts out from the center of it a square. Not the whole loaf is used. 
he cuts out a square that's called the lamb, and however large that's going to be needed for, for the celebration of the liturgy, because it's very important that, uh, just as St. Paul says, we, are, we, though many, partake of the one bread and, and become the one body, that it's, that it's all from the same, the same loaf that we partake. So he cuts out a square from the middle, the rest of the bread, and, and sometimes there are many loaves in a large, in a large church, the rest of, of the bread is what's cut up and given out as blessed bread after Holy Communion. But it's, it's the middle of the loaf that's taken out and, and it, called the lamb, or, or the, the Western term that's used, uh, the host, which, which means the offering. Uh, and it's placed on, on the plate that you've seen, uh, the word, the word in Greek that, that that's called is the discos. If you're, you know, you watch the Olympics where they throw the discos. The, just, the word discos just means plate. <laughs> uh, or sometimes the Latin word is used paten, which means the same thing. And so he places he places the the bread, the lamb, on on the discos, and then he may cut out in addition to to the lamb, which is which is offered as the Eucharistic offering. He he may also cut out a number of other particles, in, and when he does that, he commemorates the Mother of God, the saints, and the living and the dead. Uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that at another time. Then he. Uh, pours the wine and water into the chalice, and again, uh, in, according, to, according to the traditional usage of the church, it should always be from the one cup that everyone receives. Even if you're in a large church like ours that has to use several cups, those several cups are to be filled from the one. Always one bread, one cup. And so he, he pours wine, and then following the practice of, of Christ at the Last Supper, uh, who, who followed the, the, what was customary in Israel, pour some water in with the wine too. And this was also understood uh, spiritually that, that uh, because it is in the Eucharist that we receive uh, the, the blood of Christ, and, and it is St. John in the Gospel that speaks of the opening of the side of Christ that I read to you about on, on uh, the night that you were chrismated. Uh, one of the soldiers opened his side with a lance, and at once there came out blood and water. And also the, the wine and the water are seen to be uh, symbolic of the divinity and humanity of Christ, the unity of the, of, of the divinity and humanity in Christ. So, so we use, we use the, the wine mixed with a small amount of water. And then, after he does that, he puts veils, covers, over the, over the chalice and the discos. And the use of the veil, we'll, we'll stop here tonight, at this point. The use of the veil, we always veil in the church uh, that which that through which God reveals his mysteries. And I think the best way for you to understand the veil is to think of the Christmas present. Uh, you know, when, when, the, when the gift is wrapped, that's what, that's what shows that there, is, that there is a hidden mystery here. And then when the wrapping is taken off, then the mystery is revealed. So likewise, those, those things in the church through, that God chooses to reveal himself, most especially the Eucharist, we use the veil to, to, to set them aside, set them apart as being, being the means through which uh, the Lord will become present among us. So that having been done, we're, uh, the, the gifts being prepared, the, the ordained priest being prepared, and the people having assembled, all those three things, then we're ready to actually begin the celebration of the liturgy proper, and we'll start with that next time. Brian. I may be jumping ahead, but uh, at some point in the service, an acolyte comes around with a pitcher that is now apparently uh, heated wine. Hot, hot water. It's hot water. Hot water, and we will talk about that okay. later. Okay, and yeah. is that so? The the water. There's two. Water is placed into the chalice twice. Okay. Once a, the first time, a small amount when the chalice is prepared before the beginning of the liturgy. Then a second time, immediately before communion, uh, an amount of hot or even boiling water is poured into the chalice. And this, the purpose of that, I'll, I'll just mention it now, is to make the chalice warm. Because, because what we receive is the living body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's one of these, one of these, these visible ways. Of... Yes, Kelly. Um, 
Well, speaking of water, um, at the the Epiphany, we took home jars of water. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe you could elaborate on the use, sure. what the purpose is. Sure. If if you listen, if you listen to the prayers for for the blessing of the water, that long and very wonderful, beautiful prayer. Uh, what what we're doing there is again, uh, as everything in the church does, it's an, it's an entering into what Christ has done for us, and we we understand that Christ, through entering into the water, materially in the flesh, he's made the wa he has made water holy. Not only, not only is it the means by which our physical life is sustained, but it's also the means by which our, our, we are given the new life in baptism. So the water is used in the, the blessed water is used in the church for, for a number of things. First of all, we bless ourselves with it in remembrance of our baptism. Uh, it's used, uh, as, as the prayers say, for the blessing of our homes. That, by the way, for those that I still haven't come to yet, I will within the next couple of weeks. The priest comes to the, to the homes uh, in the church and blesses them. Sprinkles. It's an extension of what goes on in the church. Sprinkles the home with the blessed water. It's also used. Uh, it, it's also used by by the members of the church in times of, of sickness or trouble. You, anoint with it? you drink it. Oh, you, drink you drink it. it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Bless. Uh, what do you add to it besides prayer? It tasted like it had lemon in it. <laughs> well, I don't know. No, it's, 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 it's just pure water, spring water. That's, uh, though I, some, some, that, some, that some people get might have gotten some of the, the, the taste of the sprinkler in it. I use branches of rosemary, uh, the herb, you know, to sprinkle it with. And sometimes that can give a little taste to it. That's... Fulton. I was wondering. I was just uh, curious. What what happens when you have leftover Eucharist? What, what what do you do with that? Well, we'll talk about that detail in la later. But but by the end of the liturgy, whatever is left is consumed by the deacons. Oh, it's, I was just yeah, curious. yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. But on the, uh, what's what remains from each liturgy is consumed by the deacons. But on the other hand. Uh, on the altar in the tabernacle, the tabernacle is the golden vessel that uses looks like a little church. There is there is preserved what is called there uh, the reserved sacrament. Uh, it, it, it is the the uh, holy Eucharist that is saved from year to year from the liturgy that celebrated on Holy Thursday, the day the day of the Last Supper, and and a portion of of, of the Eucharist from that day is dried and kept in the tabernacle for two reasons. First of all, because the Eucharist needs always to be present in the church building because it is, it is Christ present among us in his body and blood. But there's, uh, there's also uh, the, the practical reason is that uh, when, when someone uh, is, is dying, or, or unable to come to, to, uh, to the liturgy to receive communion when they are sick. They are brought communion from the reserve sacrament. You see, if somebody were, were, were to, to be dying tonight, and, and it has always been the desire, uh, whenever it's possible, uh, before death to receive Holy Communion, the priest would come and take a particle from the tabernacle and, and moisten it and, and give them communion. That's why... That's why whenever, whenever, whenever and if ever there should be a very serious sickness, uh, the first thing you should do is, is, is let the priest know. And even if, even if a person is too ill to, to be present at the Sunday liturgy, let's say more than one week, uh, it's always good to let the priest know and, and because, because Holy Communion can be brought. Usually, usually, you know, we try to use some common sense there. That that if 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 we can't come to liturgy one Sunday because we have a bad cold, well, then we wait till the next Sunday. But if we're really seriously ill, then we need to. It's. I was wondering. You always refer to the church as um, a she, and mm -hmm. I was wondering why you do that. That's a very good question, because. The scripture speaks of the church as the bride, the bride of Christ. The Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. So we speak of all of us as members of the church. The church is our mother, 
and the church is the bride of Christ. So we, we, always, we always use that, that uh, feminine word to refer to, to, refer to the church and, and masculine, he, to refer to Christ, the bridegroom. Les. Uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun. I was wondering about that uh, red light there on the rude screen. Do you call that a rude screen? Well, the, the rude the, uh, is, is an old English word that refers to the, the cross that's always above the entrance to the altar. So rude means, means cross. The, the medieval English churches, by the way, had, had a screen, like an icon screen. And they would call it sometimes the rude screen because it, the feature of it was a great big, great big crucifix in the middle. It wasn't just in the Eastern or the Greek church that they had the screen. Yeah, exactly. And uh, now the, the light, there, the, there's always lights kept burning either, either on the altar, above the altar, or behind the altar. In our case here, it's, it's behind the altar, the seven-branched lamp that's kept burning behind the altar. And that, that the presence of God, the presence of God. And the, see, the light is blessed every year at Easter on Holy Saturday, and it's the same light that's kept going through the whole year long till it's blessed again at, at the next Easter. Kelly? Um, my question, you, you say this, that these terms a lot, and, and I'm not clear or I've missed the meaning. New Covenant, Old Covenant, were there Christians in the Old Testament? No. Old, old Covenant, Old Testament means before Christ, before Christ coming in the flesh, everything that had to do with, with Israel, the Jewish people, to prepare for his coming. From, from Abraham to Jesus, that's the time of the Old Covenant. Abraham through Moses, through, through uh, the, the kings, uh, King David and Solomon, the prophets. All of that period when, when Israel was the one people in the world that had been given uh, God's revelation and God's promises. And the, the, the purpose of that was to prepare the whole world to receive it. And of course, we know what happened, that, that, uh, that for the most part they did not. They did not receive it. So the new covenant is what comes fully with, with Christ. That's why we call John the Baptist the one who, who is the, the uh, uh, who he comes between the two. He brings all of the prophets of the Old Testament to the end and ushers in the coming of Christ. Father David, is there much variation in the liturgy that we celebrate with other uh, ethnic churches celebrating the same liturgy? No, no. The only the only differences would be in very minor matters. Just as just as the, because there all because although there has been unity in the church's manner of celebrating the liturgy from even we can say from the fourth century from place to place, that unity has never meant an exact uniformity. Though every place has always had their little variations. But, but it's all little variations within the same the same pattern, the same prayers. But the terms that then are used in same. the, the anaphora and those same. all have particular meaning right. of that part of the service in relationship to the whole? Yes. And and I'll try to explain all of those terms as we go along. Less? We'll be getting to music later. Oh, now you want music class. Well, if you, if you, if you want music class less, you have to join the choir. <laughs> well, so this is good. This is, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful and joyful time. And, and so we'll, we'll now, probably for the, next, uh, for the next several weeks, we'll keep this up because it's very important for you. I think, and, and uh, we'll, we'll go through the liturgy, uh, we'll go through the rest of the sacraments, speak of some of the practices in, in the life of the church, the Mother of God, the saints, some more of the feast days, and uh, then, then you'll be ready for, for entrance into Lent. <laughs> When you were baptized in the Jordan, O Lord, the worship of the Trinity was revealed. For the voice of the Father bore witness to you and called you his beloved Son. 
Son, and the Spirit in the form of a dove confirm the truth of his word. O Christ, our God, you have revealed yourself. You have enlightened the world. Glory to you. God is with us through his grace and love for mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.